All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Heat 2 of the 2023 University of Glasgow Three Minute Thesis Competition. Uh, I'm so delighted, and as are all of Team 3MT, to have you join us this afternoon. My name is Rhoda Stefanatis, and I am researcher, developer, specialist for research staff in the research culture and research development team, but also previously a very avid Drosophilist and mitochondriac, so I'm very excited about all the talks today. Um, this year, overall, we have 27 competitors taking, across, uh, talk, taking part across two heats, which are multidisciplinary. And today we have 19 fantastic presentations to share with you this afternoon. Um, our presenters today are PGR researchers from across all our schools. And um, each of our presenters will have three minutes uh, to present a topic of their research with one single static PowerPoint slide. Oh, that's the slides just coming up. I'll just give that a wee second. And second. There we go. Great. Um, okay, so. As I said, each of our participants will have three minutes to present the topic of the research with one single static PowerPoint slide. The top six presentations, as decided by our wonderful judges, will proceed to the final on the 31st of March. The winner of this heat will receive a £40 voucher prize and the runners up will receive a £10 voucher. I don't know if, this, I don't know if the slides are moving forward, but I can still see the title slide. Okay, perfect. And just also before uh, I introduce our wonderful judges today, um, we have six winners in heat two. And now this is more than in heat one, but it's to reflect that the, there's a larger group of competitors. And so that everyone taking part, all of our 27 competitors have the same chance to make it to the final. Okay, so since 3MT is all about communicating your research and leveling up your public engagement skills, this year on the Jandian panel, we wanted to highlight those members of staff at the University of Glasgow who work behind the scenes in communication and public engagement. And on that note, I would like to take the opportunity to introduce our fantastic judges. So first up is Anya Allardyce, who is our communications manager in the area of external relations. Uh, our second judge is Annie Miller, communications manager for the MRC CSO Social and Public Health Sciences Unit. And our third judge is Laura Tyler, uh, research services and external relations. Um, at last, but certainly not least, is Rachel Brady, one of the administrators in Research and Innovation Services Central Support Team. Thank you very much to all our judges for giving up the time to be with us today. So if we can just move to the next slide. Okay, so judging criteria. Each of the judges will be scoring every presentation out of 10 in two categories, comprehension and content and engagement and communication style. Once the presentations are finished, the scores will be tallied and the judges will leave the room, leave the room to deliberate, to choose a winner and five runner ups who will proceed to the final. Um, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so rules. The competition rules are on screen now. The key rule is that the presentations are limited to three minutes maximum or face disqualification. There will be a timer on each slide and in the form of a circle which gradually appears. When the timer is finished and then 3MT appears, the presenter must stop speaking. Presentations are considered to have commenced when the presenter starts the presentation through movement or speech, but we will count you in. I will count you in. Speakers, uh, please use your own timer and we will also, our fabulous team will also be um, timing you off screen. Um, in between talks, please have your cameras off and um, clap and support. Also feel free to use the chat. Our decisions are final. If speakers go over the three minute mark, we will potentially, we will politely, sorry, halt the presentation. Um, okay, and then I think we have one more slide. Um, so just what to expect. This is the running order for this afternoon. Uh, I will be introducing each of our presenters in turn, and we'll be taking a short break in the middle of the day uh, of this session. And we encourage you to take a moment away from your screens or a dance break during those times to prevent Zoom fatigue. 
There will also be a 10 to 15 minute judging break at the end to allow for the final scores to be tallied before announcing who will go through to the final. As many of you have given presentations via Zoom know, this can be much harder than presenting to a live audience. Because we aren't able to applaud in person, please, strong, uh, please use the chat function to show your appreciation of the speakers um, and set your message to go to all panelists and attendees. <laughs> Um, if we could all keep our mute as well, that would be great. Thank you so much. I think somebody just came off mute. Okay. Um, so if I think we've come to this, this point where we're going to start. If, yes, absolutely. So if I can invite you, Zipeng, to come to the front of the virtual room, as I heard it described to me the other day. And when you're ready, I will count, count you in. Three, two, one. Okay. How far is it to go from unhappy to happy in Mandarin learning? Is study always boring? Is learning Mandarin really a big problem for students in areas where Mandarin is not a mother tongue? Does Mandarin reading still confuse learners? No. All all the above problems will be solved. A hungry rabbit will make it possible for students to fall in love with Mandarin learning from now on. The purpose of my research is to test the impact of a new digital reading game named Hungry Rabbit on student Mandarin learning. And based on educational games, Hungry Rabbit provides learners with simple, relaxed, and happy learning styles, improves learning motivation, reading comprehension, and reduces learning anxiety. In the experiment, I will compare the test result of reading three ebooks with the same difficulty levels, but different contents and different presentation ways to get a result of the impact of the hungry rabbit on Mandarin learning. Participants will join in the experiment in the following three steps. Step one is to read a regular ebook. Step two is read an audio ebook, and step three is engaging in the hungry rabbit. The game is based on learning and remembering new words and storyline. The task for players is to help a hungry rabbit plant and obtain carrots. Players first need to read their ebook from the game and memorize the new words listed on each page with pinyin. The player then uses the memory to match pinyin and Chinese words correctly to make carrots grow out of the ground. And after that, players are required to complete a puzzle based on their uh, understanding of the storyline. And upon successful completion of the task, players will get a shovel to dig the carrots out for the hungry rabbit. So, I wish your research will provide a good opportunity to discover better and easier ways for Mandarin learning. And I believe that all Mandarin learners will find a happy way for learning. Okay, thank you, that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, excellent. Oh, we've got some comments uh, about how they like to focus on the psychology in higher education. Um, yeah, so great. Thank you so much. And we're going to move on to our next speaker. Um, Nyla, come through. Your slide is on. So when you're ready, I'm going to count you in. Three, two, one. Yes, I'm ready. This is an era of advanced technology where we all are using different kinds of autonomous devices to make our life easy such as smartwatch, telehealth service systems, autonomous cars, and robots. Do you know how these systems are processing our data? Are you sure that your data is not being shared with other third parties for different kinds of purposes, such as advertisement, 
The question is here is that, is there any mechanism through which we can protect our data from data theft, data breaches, hacks, and attacks? Many modeling techniques have been developed, such as Stride, Lindon, and Attack Trees, but none of them provides the guarantee about the fully protection of our personal data. General Data Protection Regulation, which is also known as GDPR, provides protection of fundamental rights and freedom of individual persons regarding the processing of our personal data. My research is focusing on how to develop a novel modeling technique based on GDPR compliance for autonomous system. This modeling technique is proposed to identify and try to mitigate non-compliant threats within the system. For example, I have identified the non-consent and non-provided right to erasure threats within the telehealth service system. A knowledge base of this system is developed on the top of which the inference is performed to identify the non-compliance threats. Our GDPR compliance modeling technique leverage, stride, lend on, and integrate with the GDPR principle. In future, I will be developing our own GDPR ontology and identifying and modeling non-compliance threats within the autonomous system. I hope this modeling technique is going to work and try to use our different kind of autonomous system with assurity that our personal data is not going to be hacked or there won't be any kind of data breaches. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Naila. That was so interesting. Um, and I think there's quite a lot of comments in the chat agreeing with me. Extremely useful and pertinent as anyone who's gone through all that GDPR has no knows. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so let's move on to our next speaker. So if I can bring, I think, yeah, excellent. So to Zoom, if you want to come to the front of the virtual room, amazing, and turn your camera on. And then when you're ready, I'll count you in three, two, one. So, hi, everyone. Have you guys heard of surgical robots? They are not like the robots you see in sci-fi movie. They are not here to take over the world. In fact, they are here to help us human out. Now, some of you might be wondering, what are surgical robots? Well, think of surgical robots as Iron Man for surgeons. They are telemanipulation systems that allow human surgeons to carry out complex procedure with a greater precision and flexibility than ever before. By using a surgeon console, computerized control system, and patient side cars that houses robotic arms holding the dural telescope and surgical instruments, surgical robots are able to perform five minimally invasive procedures, which is less invasive and less traumatic compared to open surgery. But with any new technology, there are controversies surrounding its use. One of the main concerns is the high cost of purchasing and its equivocal clinical outcomes. And yes, it is true, they are not cheap. One robot can cost almost two million pounds. However, despite the concern, the Scottish NHS has announced a national investment of 20 million in 10 surgical robots showing that they believe in the potential of this technology to transform healthcare. Now, you might be thinking, is it worth investing in surgical robots? This is a great question, and that I have sought to answer in my research. I evaluated the clinical evidence of robotic surgery to determine whether it delivered better patient outcome compared to traditional surgery as it claimed. And I am pleased to say that my findings show that robotic surgery can significantly improve patient outcome in several clinical fields, including collateral, gynecological, liver pancreas, and bleary surgery and upper gastrointestinal procedures. In fact, patients who undergo robotic surgery experience shorter hospital stays and lower complication rates, which is beneficial in reducing invasive procedure and boosting hospital capacity. So, how do we optimize the use of robotic surgery in Scotland after the purchase? This is another great question that I'm exploring in my research. 
by evaluating the cost effectiveness of robotic surgery, I aim to support NHS Scotland in strategically setting a route for shifting the robotic surgery with the evidence base to have a better resource allocation given the financial framework and to make sure that investment leaves ultimate returns. Generally, Surgical robots are a promising technology that has potential to transform healthcare as we know it. By providing greater precision and flexibility in complex surgery, this machine can improve patient outcome and reduce the burden of hospital across Scotland. And I, for one, am excited to see where this technology will take us in the future. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. I want to read this research immediately please thank you um thank you. thank you so much and you've got some great comments from the rest of the group thank absolutely thank you so so much for that let's move on to our next speaker as we have a very tight schedule today so jonathan if you would like to come to the front of the virtual room and start your talk in three two one hi let's talk about sex a bit there are two major types of reproduction, sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction. In sexual reproduction, however, the plasmodium, the, the parasite that causes malaria is able to undergo both sexual and asexual reproduction. When a, a parasite enters an infected individual, it enters a red blood cell, eats, grows, and when it has had enough food, multiplies, and then multiplies into multiple parasites and then go through the process of eating and growing. This, this process increases the parasite numbers exponentially, therefore causing the disease malaria. However, a tiny proportion of these parasites decide to be sexual, thereby developing into male and female forms. Then the question comes, can we block this sexual development phase so that we can be able to stop the transmission of malaria because these are the sexual forms that are picked up by mosquito and transmitted to another individual. This is where my PhD comes in. When we were looking at a particular parasite that was responsible, that, that was resistant to a new malaria drug, we found that this particular parasite is unable to make male and female parasites. The first thing we wanted to find out what is making this parasite unable to make female parasites. And the male parasite it produces, a tiny proportion of male parasite it produces, could not as flagellate, meaning they could not get hard. So these two parasites cannot be transmitted when picked up by a mosquito. When we looked at the transcriptome of these parasites, basically looking at all the genes that have been activated or unactivated, we realized that a group of genes called kinases were unactivated in this parasite line. Therefore, we, we are currently trying to look at the exact function of each of these kinases, each of these kinases genes in the development of the sexual stages of these parasites with the aim that if we're able to find inhibitors that can block this uh, sexual development, like contraceptive, can stop the development of the parasite in its sexual stage. So in the future, in partnership with other drugs that kill the asexual forms, these contraceptives that we are trying to develop can stop malaria transmission. Hopefully, by the time my PhD ends, I may be able to find some contraceptive that can make these parasites less sexual and more asexual. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. We've got some great comments in the chat. Fascinating, vital work. And I agree, this is so interesting to me as well as a former <laughs> geneticist, so absolutely. Um, Thank you so, so much. Let's move on. And our next speaker is Abdul. Let me welcome you. Am I audible? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I'm just going to welcome you to the front of the okay. virtual room and count you in three, two, one. Hello, my name is Abdul Jabbar. Imagine if you have a light bulb in your hand. It radiates light in all possible directions. Now imagine if you have a torch in your hand you can focus the light towards a desired user instead of radiating it and wasting the energy in all possible directions. The same analogous phenomenon can be applied to antennas. There are some antennas who radiate, which radiate energy in all possible directions. For example, the Wi-Fi antennas in your homes, in your, in your room, and in your offices. But there are some specialized antennas 
which radiate the energy towards a specific desired user instead of radiating in all direction. Now, antennas are eyes and ears of any wireless communication. You can take an example of your homes, commercial areas, and offices where you are enjoying the wireless communication. You can think of a wide communication. If it would have been a wide communication, there would have serious concerns regarding the reconfigurability and mobility issues. For example, if you're using a PC in your home, you cannot move it here and there. But if you have a laptop with a wireless connection, you can move anywhere and you can work from everywhere. So another important wireless avenue is the industries and the smart factories. You can take an example of Amazon. The Amazon and the smart factories are moving towards the reconfigurable environment and the flexible manufacturing where smart entities play their role. For example, smart robots, automatic guided vehicles. And the automatic guided vehicles and these smart, road, uh, smart robots are meant to perform tasks at one place, and then they are meant to go to another place. So my task is to design beam steerable and beam forming antennas, which should radiate their beams towards a specific robot at a specific time. And once it completes its task, the antenna should be able to provide the beam towards a new direction to the, to the same robot. In this way, wireless communication uh, can be enabled with the full potential in the smart industry because conventional industries are still having a wide connection and facing the issues of mobility and reconfigurability. So using the smart antennas, a smart industry and a smart factory could soar to its full potential. That's three minutes. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Some great comments in the chat. They like your use of eyes and ears is the analogy. And I agree, it's a really interesting topic and thank you for explaining it to us. Um, next up is Antonius. So if we can- Yes, can you hear me? I can, thank you so much. Welcome to the front of the virtual room. I'm gonna count you in, in three, two, one. Hello everyone, sorry for today. I'm a little bit nervous and a little bit panicked because myself, imagining, I go to a kind of my favorite tourist destinations or big event in the city, but I end up in a situation like this, a crowd situations. But the things is getting worse where the number of people who comes to my events is exceeding the carrying capacity of that area. And it's become overcrowded. A situation that could lead into a deadly disaster. This tragedy recently happened in last November in South Korea, in Seoul, when there was a Halloween event, or in Indonesia, when there was a football event in Kanjuruan Stadium. More than 100 people died because of these overcrowded situations and panic at that time. Mass tourism like this could bring several benefits for the business and the people who depend on that situations, especially for their economic growth, but also comes with several drawbacks including uh, damage to the heritage building as their assets and also their facility, but then also have a risk for a deadly disaster. My research will try to mitigate this kind of drawbacks by trying to deliver investigating and developing a deep learning model to understand people behavior in a crowd situation. My research will try to capture a sequence image from the CCTV and try to projecting their future move and future trajectory and velocity and calculating with a mathematical approach to understand and answer where and when the collisions, the disaster will happen in the future. The challenge of my research is that I need to deal with a high level of computation level, but somehow I also works with are delivering information as fast as I can to the stakeholder that needs these critical information, such as government or their management. Many researchers have done the similar thing with me, but they are more focused on counting the people in the crowd situations. My research tried to bring another point of view by understanding the behavior that could lead into certain of disaster. Last but not least, many people job and business are depend on the strong and strict tuition. That was UNWTO say. My research here tried to bring 
artificial intelligent technology and deep learning technology to mitigate the drawbacks of mass tourism. Meanwhile, maintaining the sustainability of the tourism itself. Thank you. Much. That is so interesting. We've got some great comments in the chat about your talk and the subject as well. So thank you so, so much. And please take a look at the chat. Um, we're going to move on now to Claire. So if I can see, perfect. Claire, I can invite you to the front of the virtual room. And please go ahead once you see your slide in three, two, one. Claire? I'm sorry, I was muted the whole time. Can I start no, again? No, no, at all. Of course you can start again. I was just checking that you were there. That's absolutely fine. Okay, go ahead. Take your time and three, two, one. Hello, um, so my name is Claire Rosemary and my thesis title is Bio-inspired nanophotonic devices to control light emission on a chip. So my project um, basically involves taking designs from nature and natural systems and they've already undergone billions of years of evolution to optimize their light um, interactions. This is like flowers, leaves, butterflies, that kind of thing. And I apply these designs to nanoscale devices. So to get a like rough idea of scale, if I took the designs that I'm working on and put them in a row side by side and um, I could get 10,000 of these in a one centimeter long line. So um, I'm primarily looking at golden angle Vogel spirals which is the pattern that you can see in sunflower heads or the small black display in the image on the bottom right. So on the left is an image that I've taken showing how light is emitted from this design when it's excited by a laser. Um, the equations that you can see um, is how you make these spirals in polar coordinates. Um, the conversion between the X and Y with polar coordinates is um, what you can see in the graph. Um, so in this equation, A0 is a scaling factor, um, N is the value um, for the number of holes that you want in um, your structure, and um, alpha is basically the golden angle. This is how you take a Vogel spiral and turn it into a golden angle Vogel spiral. Now this golden angle, you can find by taking 360 degrees and divide it by the um, golden ratio squared. And this is particularly interesting because as you may be aware, the golden angle is found all throughout nature as well. Now, these designs are really pretty in theory and in practice. However, why are they also incredibly useful? Why is better light emission from like chips um, a really useful thing in technology? So these devices allow for quantum light emission, which is an emission where a single photon or like a single particle of light is emitted in a steady stream from the surface of um, my samples. So this quantum emission can be useful for quantum communications, which is an incredibly secure and encrypted method of communicating with people. Um, it's literally unbreakable um, unless you intercept both the code and the key. However, if you start intercepting one or the other, the people sending and receiving can see that you've um, started intercepting this code and they'll just stop the transmission. So the message that you were trying to break, just like it will stop. So um, these devices, the golden angle Vogel spirals, are also particularly um, exciting because it's been seen that you can encrypt orbital angular momentum into these photons. Now, this is a type of spin and it provides an extra degree of freedom in the emission. Now, this is also like an extra dimension in space in which you can encode information. So um, this can be seen in the diagram um, on the upper right, where L is a quantum number. I chose a quantum number of one as it's like the most simple to visualize. Um, the photon of light is not actually spinning, which is where it gets quite confusing. However, the best way to visualize it mathematically is to look at like a packet of light and see that the direction in which it's propagating is rotating around um, the axis in which the direction it's going in. Um, this is really useful for applications like quantum communications again, because it means you've got like an extra degree in which you can encode um, your information. So it's even harder to break. 
but it also means you can apply it to things like multidimensional data storage. So whilst the entire world of technology um, is expanding rapidly around us, we need ways of storing information. Now, um, this adds an entirely new dimension. So you can have three dimensions of storage, whereas currently we only have two. Um, so with this, I plan to further enhance light matter interactions of my devices so I can get even more single photons, which makes quantum communications um, even more reliable. Um, but also I'm hoping to advance I, technology. Sorry, I'm going to have to stop you there. OK, sorry, just went over a little bit. OK, thank you so much. Uh, please check out the chat. There's so much uh, love for your research project here. Um, please check it out. OK, so we're going to move on to Danny. You would like to come to the front. Hiya. Oh, yeah. oh, wrong, wrong, Danny. Never mind. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> we'll come back for you, Daniel. We'll come back. <laughs> okay. Okay, Danny, when you're ready, uh, you'll see your slide, and I'm going to count you in three, two, one. Hello, everyone. My name is Danny Asi, and I'm a biomedical engineer and a third year PhD student at the University of Glasgow. My research mainly focuses on developing the modern version of the Fontaine of youth. So what I mean by that, as we know from the books, stories, legends, or even from Johnny Depp's movie, Pirates of the Caribbean, that the pressure drop from that Fontaine can reverse the aging process, meaning it makes us younger. And it makes us younger in both ways, from the outside, how we look, and from the inside, how our body functions. And as we should know by now, the true beauty comes from the inside. That is why my research focuses on reversing the aging process of the human brain to make it young, powerful, and efficient as it was or is in our prime. So let's move on to the human brain, which is still the biggest unsolved puzzle box in the entire world. We still haven't reached the full potential and we still haven't discovered all the functions. But while talking about the brain, we need to understand two fundamental parameters, neurons and synapses. Neurons are connected through synapses, creating, forming the complex network, just like delicious bowl of spaghetti. And as spaghetti can be cooked in different way, creating different textures, neuron possess an ability to change and adapt depending on the environment. And this change is called neuroplasticity, which is one of the most important process because it allows us to create new memories and learn new things. But when we get older, our learning and memory abilities decreasing. So for example, when we get older and we want to learn the new language, it's more difficult for us compared to the young individuals. We simply tend to forget words, phrases, faces, and this can even evolve in the worst case scenario into Alzheimer or Parkinson's disease. That is why I have created an implantable neuromodulator device. So what this device can do and how it actually helps. By sending electrical signal at specific time and at specific voltage, I can increase learning and memory abilities. So it, we can cancel the aging process. We can make our brain again young, powerful, and efficient, regardless of the age, with the possibility to slow down or even cancel the Alzheimer's disease. So the last question should be, can we really implant this device into the human brain today? And the answer is no but I haven't finished my PhD yet and I'm the person that never gives up. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. This is really, really interesting work and there's a lot of love for it in the chat, especially your, um, your image here as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. And our next presentation is from Andy, MD Tanzip. Um, if you would like to come to the front of the virtual room. And your camera on there you are great what an excellent background um great so once you see your slides i'm going to count you in one uh, one three two one okay um uh, thank you for giving me the chance to present my opinion um at first i would like to request everyone to move your arms and legs because i would like to uh introduce you an interesting device which can uh produce energy just from your movement and there's the triboelectric nanogenerator, which is shown in the uh, right side of the uh, left side of the of the figure. Uh, the background of the of this study is the static energy. Uh, it's similar to the case of when we brush our hair uh, using comb. Uh, at, at the time, 
uh, we can hear some tapping sign sound. Uh, so from where it is coming from? During the, during brushing your hair, uh, there is a friction is created, and from that 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 that, that aspect, uh, we are getting the static energy in terms of voltage, and that phenomena is utilized in the triability nano generator. Uh, so when the material one and material two is coming in contact and uh, when it is it is getting separated at the time the voltage is actually generated and this th there is an integration of surface roughness in this regard because the surface are, the, do, the two materials are coming in, in contact so what is actually happening uh, during our experimental phenomena uh, as shown in the second column uh, in, in the in the blue figure uh, we, we we can see that uh, in the green uh, lines, which are called aspirities, in terms of like in, it's in the, uh, uh, it's like a hill on the ground. So when the material one and material two come in contact, these hills on the ground, or in terms of asperities, uh, affects the contact area. So high, what we actually got, the con higher the contact area, the greater the energy will be produced. But there is no specific, uh, uh, surface roughness projection uh, uh, we got from the experimental result. So we got an iterative analysis uh, for, for the for which can be done the, the, by the computational framework with the MOFEM. MOFEM is the measure oriented finite modeling uh, software which was developed by the uh, uh, people in the Glasgow Computational Engineering Center, where we are solving the problems like time dependent problem, contact problem, random roughness between the material one and material two and so many other things. So after solving these things, uh, 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 after my PhD, uh, we, we, we can say that uh, uh, we will be in the time set where the people will be able to produce energy just from their movement uh, during their walking or doing exercise in the gym. Thank you so much for your considering uh, and listening to my presentation. Thank you so much. I think quite a few of us have now been introduce the nano generators that weren't before so thank you for that and please take a look at the chat so we have reached our halfway point ish so we're going to break now for five minutes so that will bring us to come back in at quarter two so 1545 i would love to have all of you back and we can continue with the rest of our program for today okay see you in five
see everyone. Hopefully a lot of you are back at your screens and we are ready to start with the second half of these great presentations. Now you saw him earlier and <laughs> it's now his turn. Daniel, if you would like to come to the front of the virtual room. Hello, um, sorry about that. Fair Danny, no worries, I'll go with Danny. No, I, was, I should have stuck with Daniel the first time. <laughs> <laughs> no bother at all. Amazing. So uh, once you see your slide, I'm going to count you in. Three, two, one, go ahead. So as you all know by now, I'm Daniel, and I'm a third year PhD student studying symbiotic human robot teams for hazardous environments. So robotic, super cool systems, which can consist of legged, wheel, aerial, or subsea vehicles. Uh, robots are typically used to reduce the need to put humans in dangerous scenarios. However, se several challenges are created for industry when using robots. These include challenges in enabling robots to communicate with each other when they are from different companies and software languages, such as in the top left image there. Many robots operate in their own designated languages. For example, a legged robot may operate in Python, such as French, and a wheeled robot may use ROS, such as German. It currently is my job to translate these communications between each other. Point two, there currently isn't a robot which is available that is the best robot in the world. And by best, I mean can swim, fly, carry heavy objects, fit into tight spaces, where the list of capabilities continues. So I don't want to say it's impossible, as I'm currently getting recorded on camera, but I know it would be incredibly difficult to create this. Therefore, we can utilise a robotic team which can work together to complete objectives during a mission together. So my research, my research utilizes symbiosis to overcome these issues. Symbiosis is inspired via nature and can be described as a beneficial relationship between the two organisms. This can be applied to robots where they operate autonomously to overcome challenges as a team. Since there are many types of robots with different strengths and weaknesses, when a challenge is faced, symbiosis or communication can lead to automa automated decisions to be made by the robots to designate different parts of a mission to another robot. I have applied this in a live demonstration, as you can see in the bottom left there, where a, reli a reliability and resilience problem was faced on the wheeled robot pictured. And the legged robot automatically deploys itself to collect the battery and take it over to the Husky to lend a hand at helping to solve a problem. My research also looks at how a human can coordinate the robotic team via a dashboard on the laptop. This allows a human to operate a robotic team from the safety of their office or even home. So, as I finalise, let's leave the dangerous, difficult, dirty and dull jobs to the robots. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much for that. It was so great. And again, lots of love in the chat, um, especially with the what this the potential applications are amazing. Thank you so, so much. Okay, we're going to move on now to Tasman. If you'd like to come to the front of the virtual room and turn your camera on. Ah, uh, yeah. My, my no name. worries. Thank you so much. Great to have you. We're going to see your slate and then I'm going to count you in in three, two, one. Rabies is a viral disease which targets the central nervous system of mammals causing damage and dysfunction of the brain and spinal cord. Left untreated, rabies is 100% fatal, with one person estimated to be dying of rabies every nine minutes. So rabid dogs are infer informally referred to as mad dogs. This is because a dog experiencing furious, furious rabies often display signs akin to madness, such as sudden and unprovoked aggression, biting and foaming at the mouth. So 99% of human rabies cases occur through contact with an infected dog, usually, usually as a result of a bite. So an unfortunate meeting with a mad dog can have deadly consequences. The Zero by 30 Global Strategy Campaign aims to end human deaths from dog-mediated rabies. But to reach zero human deaths, we have to scale up mass dog vaccinations. So this, despite the existence of safe and effective dog vaccines, rabies control strategies in many rabies endemic countries still often involve indiscriminate culling, so killing of dogs, with the belief that if you reduce the size of the dog population, you reduce the prevalence of rabies. 
So this strategy has raised many concerns due to inhumane culling practices, such as poisoning, beating and shooting dogs. Importantly, culling of dogs has also been found to be ineffective as a rabies control strategy and detrimental to rabies control efforts. For example, vaccinated dogs are often among the animals killed and these individuals are likely to be replaced by unvaccinated, so susceptible dogs. Also, owners may move their dogs to avoid the culling teams, which can result in further spreading of the disease. And if mistrust develops between dog owners and government officials, owners may hide or move their dogs during vaccination campaigns out of fear that the government is actually there to kill their dogs. So in my PhD, I'm investigating the motivations behind the continued use of culling as a rabies control strategy in Tanzania, a rabies endemic country. So working with collaborators, I will hold interviews and workshops with key stakeholders. We will talk to the people who organize and carry out rabies control activities, such as district veterinary officers and livestock officers and community members who are impacted by both rabies and culling of dogs. I'll also be comparing the financial costs of culling to vaccination campaigns and comparing the long-term impact of rabies transmission between these two methods. So if a dog isn't mad, vaccines exist and indiscriminate culling of dogs is ineffective and detrimental to rabies control. Why do we cull? Thank you. <laughs> so much, that's excellent. And we've got some great comments in the chat um, about the topic and also your presentation. So please have a look. Um, we're going to move on to Tina. If you can come to the front. I'm audible. Yes, you are. Excellent. Thank you. You're going to see your slide in a second. I'm going to count you in in three, two, one. In 2025, approximately 1.1 million would succumb to bowel cancer. To give you a perspective, that is the total population of Glasgow and Edinburgh combined. Majority of these deaths would be caused by a subset harboring an alteration which makes them unresponsive to most therapies. RAS mutant bowel cancers represent a huge clinically unmet need. In my PhD, I play a cheeky little game with this cancer. I call it figure it out. Every time I figure out their evil trickery, I win a paper, yay. You see, RAS pathway is paramount for replenishing old cells with new healthy ones. In a healthy cell, the pathway is activated only when conditions outside are conducive for growth in terms of need and resources. This information is relayed to the heart of the cell by a specific set of proteins asking it to prepare for division. The RAS protein sits at the heart of a cellular network that controls multiple processes. Its proper functioning is crucial. However, things are not always ideal. Our gut makes about half a million cells per second. And when one is under such pressure, mistakes are bound to happen. Mutations are nothing but genetic mistakes and proteins born out of them are called mutants. A mutant RAS works erroneously. It conveys the cell to grow even in the absence of external stimuli. This can be detrimental to the cell and its neighbors. Nonetheless, our cell also has contingency plans in place should things grow astray. As the name suggests, tumor suppressor proteins such as APC and P53 are constantly monitoring the state of affairs within a cell. Consider them like our police or MI6. Unsolicited growth can also be halted using specific drugs. Then why is it that targeting mutant RAS has been unsuccessful so far? We recently uncovered that these cancer cells are quirky little beasts. With the defunct police and MI6, they're free to unleash chaos with no one to stop. What is more, these cancer cells are so mischievous that they expel drugs specifically targeted for them. The most fascinating aspect is that such mechanisms of drug clearance is usually seen in the liver, but you see these cancer cells exploiting it for its own survival advantage. Overall, one thing is clear, cancer is under no obligation to follow the physiological laws of survival. Thank you. 
much, Tina. Um, really engaging presentation. And the first fly on a slide today, whoop for Drosophila always, Team Drosophila. Thank you so much, that was amazing. There's also lots of really positive comments in the chat, so please have a look and respond. And we can now move on to our next speaker, which is Evie. Evie, if you'd like to turn your camera on and come to the front of the virtual room. Do you hear me? Yes, I do. Yeah, great. Perfect. Okay, you're going to see your slide in one second, and I'm going to count you in. Three, two, one, go. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Evie Bailey. I'm a PhD student at the School of Health and Wellbeing, and my PhD is about two conditions that affect children all over the world. ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder, that is the most common mental health condition for children. Approximately 70% of the children have that all over the world. And childhood maltreatment, including physical abuse, physical neglect, emotional abuse and neglect, and sex sexual abuse. That based on World Health Organization, three in four children have experienced at, at least one time per year in the life. So, uh, sorry, do you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, okay? Yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry. So based on the existing studies, we found that there are links between these two conditions, but as we see in the slide, the links are like the question, the lemma with the egg and the chicken. Which came first, the ADHD or the childhood maltreatment? Some studies support the one direction, not the music band, I think so, at least, that ADHD leads to maltreatment. Other studies suggest that childhood maltreatment leads to higher risk for ADHD. So also, how could we be sure that one, one condition is a result for the, of the other condition and not from other genetic or environmental factors such as poverty, parental education, and genetic predisposition? So here my PhD, my PhD answer these questions. Based on our analysis, we already found that regarding the direction is mostly bidirectional, not only one way that definitely ADHD leads to that or maltreatment leads to that. No, it's mostly that both conditions affect the other, affect each other. Second, analyzing genetic data, we found that there is a genetic background for both ADHD and childhood maltreatment and genetic background affect the strength of their association. Our next step is to investigate the impact of possible uh, environmental factors in combination with genetic factors. Of course, I have to highlight that our results are not deterministic and not all children who have ADHD will experience maltreatment and not all children with history of maltreatment will develop ADHD symptoms. Thank you very much. Very much, Evie, for a really great presentation. This so been... There was an issue with the camera. Sorry. Yeah, I think it froze. Um, but we we got the whole talk, so okay. don't worry. Um, well, thank so yeah, you. Some, no problem. There's some great comments in the chat, so please have a have a look when you get a chance. And we're going to move on now to Charlotte, who's our next speaker. Excellent, Charlotte. If you'd like to come to the front of the virtual room and turn on your camera, done. Amazing, that's great. I'm just going to count you in. Three, two, one. So I'm going to demonstrate how the story Cinderella can be used to navigate mass extinction, the climate and ecological emergency, and perhaps even repair damaged relationships in the more than human world. So for centuries, fairy tales and folklore have been cultural influences. They reflect life and offer imaginative possibilities of transformation or escape. So while they sometimes have fantasy or magical elements, they're essentially stories about ordinary human suffering. And traditionally, they were oral stories, often altered to reflect the different cultures and communities who told them. In the late 20th century, feminist rewritings of fairy tales put women in the position of power, as writers flipped the narrative to give the usually passive and one-dimensional female character agency and autonomy. So what my research will explore is what these tales would look like if they didn't only tell stories of the human world, but of the more than human world. What narratives can be built that go beyond just describing human suffering and instead look to the multi-species planet as it navigates grief and loss. 
So let's look at Walt Disney's 1950s adaptation of Cinderella. So the clock here and the idea of time running out is such a crucial plot point. Um, firstly, it reminds me of the doomsday clock, which is currently at 90 seconds before midnight. And instead of everything going back to normal, as it does in Cinderella, instead everything will change and the planet and its inhabitants will be irreparably damaged. Secondly, the prince's father is desperate to marry off the prince so that he can have grandchildren before he dies, entirely omitting the agency of the potential wife, but also further reinforcing the idea of time running out, the biological clock, the clock striking midnights, women must reproduce. Um, implied within the story are numerous highly problematic normative assumptions, gender roles, compulsory cis heteronormativity, anthropocentrism. There's also the sexualization of girls, harmful body shape ideals, and an inherent whiteness, all of which I will reframe under a queer lens, which will allow me to disrupt binary norms, which are built to have a dominant and a subordinate. Nature is subordinate to culture, therefore supporting the belief that nature is something to be dominated. The anthropomorphized animals are side characters to the story and their function is to serve Cinderella, strengthening that human non-human binary. So instead I'll show multi-species connections and symbiotic partners, whether human or non-human, that have a vital part in caretaking and healing our damaged planet. And this is just an example of how one story can be adapted. With my research, I will be looking at the huge corpus of fairy tales and folklore, all of which could be revisioned to create new narratives that help to understand and even repair damaged relationships in the more than human world. Thank you. Right on time. Thank you so much. Excellent talk. Really interesting. Lots of comments. Some people linking it on also to their own research in the chat. Ooh. So please have a look. OK, we're going to move on because we've got a tight schedule. And our next speaker is Serene. If you want to come to the front of the virtual room and turn your camera on so I can see you. Hello, Serene. Are we in the... Okay, right. I'm going to make the executive decision just to move on um, and we can come back if we... Uh, see her join the chat. Um, Navneet, if you're ready, could you come to the front of the virtual room and turn on your camera? Navneet? Okay. Oh, no, I can see you in the chat. Let me just give you a Hello, okay. I'll just give you one more second. I think one of our team is contacting you just to make sure that you're there. Because you're unmuted. There might be an audio. Okay. Um let's move on again to our next speaker after that, which is Jasper. Please, and then we'll come back once we figure out what's happening with our other two speakers. Jasper, can you come to the front of the virtual room and turn on your camera, please? Uh, hi. Thank you for <laughs> that was, your I'm voice so there. No, no, uh, it's all. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes, uh, I can't see your camera, but that's fine. Um, but it's, it's on. Can, can you see me now? Yes, I can. Perfect. Amazing. Thanks Thank so you. much. Okay, I'm going to count you in. Okay, thank you. Three, two, one. Hello everyone, I am Jaspreet Kaur and I want you to tell a story that how I came to this idea which is in front of you in a form of slide. So I was in India and me and my family was traveling to find a religious place where we want to bow our heads and for the goodwill. But we were lost and you might be wondering like, how come? Like, we are so interconnected with the phones and the GPS and everything. How could someone be lost at some place? So, unfortunately, the signal was so poor that we couldn't get the GPS on time. And, unfortunately, we have to get back home without paying any obedience there. So, later on, when 
I started my PhD and I came to know that I am going to do a project which will involve the networking, mobile communication. Then that reminded me that event happened because of a reason. So now I was having an opportunity to indicate that how my research expertise can play a role. So recently, when I got a mobility grant and I was in Hungary, I was discussing the same idea that how can we get in touch more accurately with all the mobile users. So my supervisor told me that there are some programmable controllers for networks which we can easily program with and talk to the mobile users which are on move. So if you can see it on the slide, there are some core networks which are connected to the base stations, which are nothing but the transmitters having the antennas which are providing us the signals. So these blue, red and blue boxes are the programmable networks. So if I want to change something, it could be antennas that can actually talk to the system, then it will be a great cost. But then we thought of just doing some programming at the Mac level so that we can talk to the mobile communication mobiles and get in touch with the users. So here comes that the programmable networks can actually talk to the mobile phones and throughout the journey, it can actually locate where the user is and then provide the same GPS location to the antennas and antennas can actually talk, provide the signal to that particular direction. So this was the whole idea of my research. I hope you liked it. Thank you. So much, that's really interesting. And um, quite a lot of comments in the chat about how connectivity is quite bad where someone lives and they've developed an interest thus and such to this subject. Amazing. Uh, yes, please check those out. So our next speaker we're gonna move on to is Erin. If Erin is there, if you could come to the front. Amazing, um, thank you. Just to say my uh, internet's a bit dodgy today, so hopefully um, okay. you can hear me all the way through. <laughs> That's fine. Do you want to disable your camera from now and that'll help? Uh, yeah, that might be a good idea. No worries. Okay. So uh, we're just going to move on to your slide and then I'm going to count you in. Mm -hmm. Please take it away. Three, two, one. Have you ever thought about what happens after death? Unfortunately, I'm talking about the death of a language. I don't have the answer to that question. But it is a sad fact that languages the world over are dying at an alarming rate. However, for some of these languages, death isn't necessarily the end. Some minority language communities are reviving their language by combining the efforts of policymakers, activists and speakers. But how do these efforts change the language itself? We do already know a lot about how and why languages change when they die, but almost nothing about how new language varieties are born through language revitalization. This project focuses on Manx Gaelic, which is the Celtic language spoken in the Isle of Man, whose last native speaker died in 1974. However, since then, members of this community have brought their language back from the brink of extinction. Many language revitalization efforts, including that of Manx, result in an increase in speaker numbers of the minority language. These are often so-called new speakers, that is to say, people who learn the minority language through immersion or bilingual education programs, or maybe as adults, often with little to no home or community exposure to the language. So they often speak differently to traditional native speakers. The Manx language community, as I said, consists only of these new speakers. Research into new speakers is an emerging field and the number of these kinds of speakers is likely to grow considerably as language revitalization efforts progress across Europe, the Americas and Australia. So this project looks at what forces shape how new speakers use language by asking three key questions. Firstly, it investigates what the language spoken by new speakers of Manx actually looks like. Do new speakers differ from each other in how they speak? And if so, why and in what ways? And secondly, it explores how new speakers think and feel about the language they're using. What beliefs and ideologies do they hold about the language? What kinds of language use do they see as good or bad and why? Crucially and novelly, this project uses ethnographic data to look at how the two above are linked to each other for revitalized minority language communities. 
Research into new speakers has hinted that the beliefs speakers hold about their language may influence how they speak, but more work is needed to know how and why exactly. In these communities, beliefs around language may alter the very structure of the minoritized language and thus serve as a major force shaping language variation and change. Certain linguistic constructions can also come to serve as emblems of specific ideological stances within these communities and also be used as ways to create authority and affirm speakers' own identities. So these kind of beliefs about language, especially if they are shared across the community, can define the very future of that language. So research into the outcomes of ongoing language revitalization attempts is essential for supporting the development of minoritized languages. This research can provide language advocates, policymakers, planners, and educators with the linguistic data that they need to make informed decisions for their language's future. So this study of Manx adds to this much needed research on revitalized endangered languages and will be an important contribution to the study of multilingualism in our ever-changing 21st century world. Go to Mayao Shugeshjach, thanks for listening. Amazing, amazing, thank you so much. Um, there's some great comments in the chat. Let me just, my windows disappeared, I do apologize. Um, lots of comments about how clear the presentation was and a lot of interest in your topic as well. So please take a chance to look at the chat. Okay, so um, we're gonna go back and try again to see if Navneet is in the call and if they would like to come to the front of the virtual room. Give it another few seconds. Okay. Oh, apparently they're here. Navneet, do you want to come to the front of the virtual room? And our wonderful team will move the slides back. Oh, there's some already different languages going on in the chat there. Navneet, can you come off your audio so I can hear you? There we are. Uh, so your audio's not working. So un unless everyone else can hear you, but I can't. No. Someone's gonna have to do some translating for me in the chat there. Google Translate. Navneet, you want to give it one more try with the audio? Okay, I'm going to chat over while our fabulous tech team support Navneet there. Um, I think we can all agree. I mean, I'm trying to make sure I can see as many of you as possible that the talk so far um, have been amazing and it's been really interesting and I'm really uh, enjoying it so far and we're almost we just have two more speakers to go so then we will be heading into waiting for the judges while they deliberate which will be really interesting um, and what we're going to do now is I think they might need a slightly longer break to support our next speaker so if you want to take a comfort break of two to three minutes we'll be back here at like 17 minutes past four, essentially. Not to be very exact, like the scientist that I am, but there we are. <laughs> 